1 Kings chapter number 17. And we'll get right into the Word of God. 1 Kings chapter number 17. Do you have that? Say amen. Alright, Brother Ben. 1 Kings chapter number 17, beginning at verse number 8. And the Bible reads, And the Word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. He called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little cruise of oil. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But, Make me, therefore, a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after, make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. <coughs> go back, if we can, to verse number 13. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first. I'm going to preach, teach, talk to you a little bit this morning on this title. It'll get you from the beginning, I promise. But we're going to talk this morning about cake wars. Make me the cake first. Brother Leo, would you ask God's blessing on this message, please? Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the service this morning and everyone here. Now, Lord, we ask to be at Pastor Bell this morning as you bring forth your word. Bring it forth to the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds to it. In Jesus' precious name, everyone. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing this morning. You can be seated in Jesus' name. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, you can't have your cake and eat it too? How many of you know what that phrase means? both ways. Perfect. You can't have it both ways. That phrase was used first in a 1538 letter. 1538. A letter from the Duke of Norfolk to a man named Thomas Cromwell when he said and I quote would you both eat your cake and have your cake? It simply means you have to make a choice. You can't have it both ways. Right. Now, in my opinion, the biggest choice that I have to make when it comes to cake is am I going to eat two pieces of cake or three pieces of cake? That's the, that's the biggest choice about the cake. It doesn't really matter if it's chocolate or if it's vanilla or if it's marble or is it buttercream or is it red? Or is it whipped topping, or what does it say? Now, I do prefer one over the other. One's way better, and I'll say it, and then you all will be on the other side, and I'll have to tell you you're wrong, so I won't say that. But one is so much, so much, so much better. Just say, say it. I got some, I got some bobbleheads, and I got some people saying, I can even listen to the rest of them. 
He's cream. Buttercream. Because butter, we're set for candy. Cream. Cream. Not just me. Every, now listen, I, I, I'm, I'm right now, in everyday life, we use so many cake references, we don't even realize how much I love cake. I love cream. me cream. some cake. And it is, it is graduation season, and so you're going to a lot of open houses. And everybody says when you go to the open house, it's all the same thing. They got some pasta, and they got some chicken. It's just a, yeah, but they got cake. <laughs> or cupcakes, whatever, which is just a miniature cake. If you think about it, when you eat a cupcake, you just ate the whole cake. It's just a miniature cake. So you can just go home and say you ate the whole cake when you eat a cupcake. But think about the cake references. I wrote some of them down. When something is easy, we say, that's a piece of cake. Why do we say that? Why don't we call it a piece of cucumber? <laughs> that was a piece of broccoli. Because <laughs> if you said that, you'd be like, that must have been the nastiest thing you ever did because it was a piece of broccoli. We don't say that why we say it's a piece of cake because everybody loves cake. When one thing is better than the other thing, we say something like this, well, I've tried them both, but that takes the cake. Why does it not take the zucchini? <laughs> it's always been said that way. Because we love cake. There's a reason we do this. Um, when something sells very quickly, really? sound like hotcakes. <laughs> Could say, sound like tomato. <laughs> but we don't say that. We say it sounds like hotcakes. Why does everybody love its cake? And then the last one, when we finish something without any trouble, we say, it was a cake walk. Piece of cake. It was simple, it was easy, that was a cakewalk. Why? Because we love, don't just say me, we love cake. If you don't like cake, come up here for a prayer. Because everyone loves cake. Now, some things don't change, because in the Bible, Elijah the prophet must have loved cake too. Because he said, give me some cake, First, now I I thought about it. Just the scripture, just the story, and it's and it's pure. It's just the story. He walks up to the woman. I I've heard some. It's usually a woman that says this in the church. I'm not saying. Listen, yeah, there it is. The preacher just wanting a handout. There he is. First thing he does. Listen, the first thing he does was ask her for a drink, right? Yeah. The Bible says. I I chuckle, brother Cluster. The Bible says. She's going to get him the drink. She's on her way to get the drink. He's like, hey, hey, hold on. While you're at it, you ever been doing something for somebody and they say, hey, while you're at it? Oh, that's the worst. Right? Wow. Hey, I know you're doing that favor for me, but while you're at it, could you? <laughs> while, you're there, while you're at the store. Okay, wives, there's a whole there. lot more while women in here than there are men. You know when the husband's sitting there watching the game? And you're getting up, and he's like, hey, if you're going in the kitchen, <laughs> since you're already going to be there, could you want to make me a sandwich while you're in there? What do you want to do? Throw the remote at him, right? And say, your legs ain't broke. You don't want to say amen, but you're thinking it. Because she was already going to get him a drink, and he says, hey, while you're at it, bring me some cake, too. Just think about it. Just think we got to be Pentecostal this morning. Hey, listen. The devil does not want you to do the right thing. I'm going to say that from the beginning. The devil, your adversary, does not want you to do the right thing. Remember, the statement that I said at the beginning. You can't have your cake and eat it too, which means you have to make a choice. I actually thought, just for a moment, because why would you say you can't have your cake and eat it? Why can't I have my cake and eat it? Because, just the same, if you eat your cake, you don't have it anymore. See, they, they said that there's a German saying, they say in Germany, you can't go swimming and not get wet. Huh. It's kind of the same philosophy. You can't have your cake and eat it too, because if you eat it, it's gone. You don't have it anymore. You have to make a choice on what you're going to do. Now, here we are in the Bible, and if we read this whole 17th chapter, which we didn't for... I want to save a little bit of time. We'll, we'll know that there's a drought. There's a drought in the land because the prophet of God had said, it's not going to rain again until at my word. 
he had that much power and clout with God that he said, it's not going to rain. There's not going to be any rain on the earth except at my word. So it had been a very, very long time since it had rained. Though it said a space of about three and a half years. Don't exactly know how far into that three and a half years we are in this scripture text. But I can tell you, they're in the middle of a drought. And in the middle of this drought, it is affecting everyone. Now let me see if I can get you all on my side this morning. How many of you are in the middle of something that you didn't have anything to do with, but it's affecting you right now? And everybody, please raise your hand. Even if you don't know what I'm talking about. Because we are in the middle of something. That's affecting everyone. Yes. Amen. We, you can call it what you want. I got my word, and you probably have a few of yours too. And we'll just keep those to ourselves in case they're not very Christian-like. But we are in the middle of something that, guess what? We didn't have anything to do with, right. but it sure is affecting us. Amen. Here's a widow in the middle of a drought. That she didn't have anything to do with, but it's affecting her. To the point that she thinks in her mind, this is going to kill me. She said with her own mouth, me and my son are going to eat this last meal that we got, and we're going to die. Hmm. Being in a situation that you didn't put yourself in, having a hard time getting yourself out because you didn't put yourself in, those are sometimes the times when it's hard to trust. Those are the times when faith comes into play. Those are the times when we can separate the saints from the ain'ts. When you're in the middle of something that you didn't get yourself in and you're having a hard time getting yourself out, you're doing your best just to survive, that's when you got to have faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. I, I might not have a lot of it, but to every man who was dealt a measure of faith, so I got a little, it's that little mustard seed faith that they talk about, and I know the mustard seed has to be planted, and if the mustard seed is planted and cultivated correctly, it grows into a pretty nice tree that makes some shade and some housing for the birds, but yeah, sometimes we just got the little mustard seed faith, and it's kind of hard sometimes to trust in that. But here's what I want you to understand. God was in control. I'm using was because in our verse, in our scripture text, in our story, God was in control. God is in control, which means right now where you sit on June 12, 2022, God is in control. And I hope you know what I'm going to say next. I don't care what happens tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. God will always be in control. And because God is always in control, Brother Cluster, God can use anything he wants. I just started thinking of some stuff in the Bible, and I, and I didn't want to write, I didn't want to make the message any longer than it's already going to be. God just, God can use anything. Way back at the beginning of the Bible, he used dirt. The Bible says that he formed man out of the dust of the earth. God can use anything. That even after he made man out of dirt, he took a man's rib to make a woman. God can use anything. Just read a little bit further in Genesis. And we find a man named Moses where God did some pretty nifty miracles with a stick. The Bible calls it a rod. It was pretty much a stick. You ever went for a walk in the woods, you find a nice stick. You're like, oh, that's a nice stuff. A walking stick. That's a nice, I could carve in that. It's a stick. And God used the rod. Remember he throws a rod down and it becomes a snake? Remember he said, 
Put your rod out and change the water. Remember he said put your rod out and part the Red Sea? What did God use a stick? Later on in Scripture, he uses a donkey. Remember about the prophet? He was going to go curse the people and his donkey wouldn't go. So he starts beating the donkey with the stick. And then the donkey starts to talk. Remember when the Remember when Noah, or Jonah, I almost said no. Remember when Jonah was running from God and he got in the ship and he was on his way to Nineveh? Do you realize the Bible says that God caused the great fish? So that whale that swallowed Jonah and kept him in his belly for three days, God used a fish. God used a donkey, a stick, a rib, some dirt. And in the, in the verses right before what we read, God used a raven, a bird. And not a very clean one at that. I've often wondered about that. Because I think there's some people that would have just starved to death. There's some folks, I'm sorry, I know everyone's got their own thing. And if this is you, please, pastor's not preaching at um, too much. I just, you know that people are like, Ew. you're going to eat that? You gonna? Did you ever, did you ever bite into a chicken wing and then look and there's like, the little veins in there, and I'm like, nope, I just eat them. <laughs> Did you ever look? No. Nope. Don't look. Just don't inspect it. They just, they taste real good. Veins and, and bones and all. <laughs> quit looking at your food and eat it. Remember when you were a kid, your parents say, quit playing with your food? You know what I'm telling you as an adult? Quit looking at your food. Eat it. So I'm wondering if some of us were the prophet Elijah. And God sent us to the brook and said, hey, if you go down by that brook over there, I'm going to take care of you. Go to the brook in the middle of a drought, which is another thing that just made, just a little bit, my, just my, how is there a brook? Would not the brook have been the first thing that dries up before the lake in the stream? A brook is smaller than a stream, and then the stream's smaller than a river, and then the river comes from the lake, and then the lake goes to the ocean. So there's a brook in the middle of a three-year drought. God says, go to the brook, and I'll take care of you. So the prophet goes to the brook. There was a little bit of water coming. I don't know where that came from. I think I know where it came from, but it certainly didn't come from rain because there hadn't been any. And then he says, while you're there... I'm going to send this dirty bird. Read back before 1 Kings about, you know, the, the Israelite people and some animals were clean and some animals were unclean. And look where the raven is. There's the raven, the dirty bird. Bring in him some meat. It says. Look, it wasn't DoorDash. It was a bird. And I don't think it was like, you know, when we see the picture of the stork and there's a stork with the big, you know, this basket or something. No, I think he had whatever he was supposed to eat in his beak. And here it comes every day. Here comes the raven. Fly now. Now, how many of you today, I'm going to go home for dinner. Sunday, it's Sunday. We eat good on Sunday. I'm going to go sit out on the back deck, wait for the bird to drop something out of its mouth. There we go. He's starving, right? Steph's definitely, like, I'm out. I ain't eating that out the bird's mouth. <laughs> God will use anything. And here's my first point, and I've got three of them. i got three points I'm going to make out of the story. And the first point I want to make is this. God wants to use you. As a matter of fact, what I want you to do is I want you to look at someone that's sitting close enough to you right now that you can make eye contact with them and tell them this. He's talking about me. He's talking about me. He's talking about me. I'm talking about you. Chris didn't have nobody to look at. Him. Look at him. Now look, here's, here's some things we want to know about this woman. The Bible says Remember, God wants to use you. There's not a person in here I'm not talking to. There's not a person that's watching on our Facebook page. And I'm talking to everyone this morning. God wants to use you. You. So I want you to take this personal. 
for the rest of this message. I want you to think that there's nobody else in the room and we're having a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm talking just to you. God wants to use you. And here's some things that God knows. God knows where you are. Right. We'll use our scripture text. Zarephath. He said, I want you to go to Zarephath. Go to this kind of like little hole in the wall city. God could have said, remember God can use anything. God could have said, okay, Elijah, I need you to go to the rich guy's house. I got this guy down the road. He was smart before this drought started to happen, and he saved up a whole bunch of stuff. He's got a warehouse full of food, and what I need you to do is I need you to go to the rich guy's house, and he'll take care of you. Hey, Elijah, what I need you to do, because there's a drought in all the land, I need you to go to the palace. Because in the palace, they got all kinds of stuff. Because that's where the king and all the noblemen and the princes, and the, the, that's where everyone that means something is going to be at. So I need you to go to the palace. I need you to get on your donkey right now and go to Jerusalem. Go to Jerusalem. That's a big old thriving city. And even in the middle of this drought, there'll be stuff in Jerusalem. So I need you to go to Jerusalem. I need you, Elijah, to go down to the marketplace. Or I need you to go down here. Or I need you to go down there. Nope. That's not what he said. So what I want you to understand right now, because people, when, when, when a preacher says something, that God wants to use you. What we do, because we are, by nature, negative people. You might not think you're negative, but by nature, when the preacher said, God wants to use you, rather than saying, that's right, amen, glory to God, we start with a list of why it's not us. He's talking about everybody else but me. Because if that preacher really knew where I was, he would know God can't use me. And my first point is God knows exactly where you are. And he still told the prophet, go to Zarephath. Go to this little hole in the wall town that nobody's really ever heard about. As a matter of fact, it belongeth to Zion. In other words, it's not even its own town. It really belongs, it belongs to another town. Uh, I, I can hook this message up with last Sunday if you got a memory that that goes that far. Um, Zarephath was kind of like the suburb. But last week we learned that there's a God that goes to the suburbs. So Zarephath wasn't anything big to brag about. Zarephath didn't have a reputation. Zarephath wasn't some big old giant town. But God knew exactly where to send the prophet. And God knows where you are right now. Amen. And I mean where you are in life. Where, where life has taken you. Or maybe, if we're honest, life doesn't always take us there. We sometimes take ourselves there. Right. Or we can say, you know what? I'm kind of in this situation just like everybody in the area, in the region was in the situation because there had been no rain. So they were now facing something that was of no doing of their own. So maybe where you're at is not your doing. Maybe you've been uh, handed something that wasn't your fault, but yet God knows where you are. So he tells the prophet, go to Zarephath and go see the richest dude in town. Go to Zarephath and see the one that everybody knows. You know that one that everybody knows? Everybody knows that person. Go there. Go see the mayor. Go see the judge. Go see the police chief. Go see the fire chief. Go see the lawyer. Go see the president. Go see the governor. Go. No, go to Zarephath and go see the widow. Because God not only knows where you are, but God knows your past. I hope somebody lets me preach to them this morning. Because not only does God know where you are, but he knows your past. This woman was 
a widow. Bible doesn't go into a whole lot of detail, but we can draw some conclusions if she was a widow. We would know that in her past that there was a little bit of pain. She's a widow. Yeah. We would know in her past that there would be some hurt. We would know that in her past there would be a little bit of probably what we could call disappointment. We could say that she had suffered maybe some loss. Can we say that? Is it fair to say that if she was a widow, she had suffered some loss? God knows where you are. And God knows your past. Maybe there's some pain there. Maybe there's some hurt. Maybe there's some disappointment. Maybe there's some loss. Maybe there's some letdowns. Maybe there's some mistakes. But here's what I want you to say. I want you to look at that same person that you looked at a few minutes ago and say, he's still talking about me. Now, maybe a lot of times you don't like it. I don't like it when people talk about me. You got to change your mindset just a little if God's talking about you. And he knows where you are. And he knows your past. And he still wants to use you. The fact that the widow was from Zarephath did not disqualify her from being used of God. As a matter of fact, it's kind of what God was kind of leaning towards. Everybody runs to the one. Oh, man, it's easy to run to this and that and the big wig and this person with the name and this person with the resources and this person with that. But this widow in Zarephath was the one that God says, you know what? If I can use the dust and if I can use the rib and if I can use a stick and if I can use a donkey and a well and a bird... I can use you. So he knows where you're at and he knows your past. And yes, he knows your present. This is in the middle of a drought. It's in the middle of a famine. And yes, it was bad. I'm not going to preach current events because I don't have to preach them to you. You all know. So we can talk about the current events without talking about your particular situation, which is what I would like you to think, but I made the comment myself to someone just the other day. In the comment about current events, I said, look, I'm 49 years old. I'm pushing 50. Remember I said I'm going to push it and push it and push it so that I never get there. I'm going to keep pushing. When somebody asked me after my birthday, how old are you? Pushing 50. 50-ish. I'm still pushing it. I'm trying to get it away, but it, it, I'm 49 years old, and if you want me to be honest, it's pretty bad. There's some things in my life right now that are the worst I've ever seen. I don't know about you. I don't know some of you older ones, but bro, I was in the depression. I wasn't. But in my 49 years, somebody tried to tell me the other day, and I... I don't want to get off of this. Somebody tried to tell me, well, brother, it's the supply and demand. Would you please explain to me why all of a sudden in 2022 that right. it's the highest demand there's ever been in the last 50 years? That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. Me no believe that. Amen. That's right. But what I do know is it's real easy to look on the situation and say, uh, now I'm going to preach. It's real easy to look on the situation and say how bad it is. This widow was in a terrible situation. The circumstances that she was in was so terrible that she had already realized in her mind, or she had already determined in her mind, that this is going to end me. In other words, here's what I want to say. I don't want to, I don't want, you, you don't have in your mind that whatever circumstance that you're dealing with right now is going to kill you physically dead, graveyard dead. But I know some folks' minds, and I'll read them for you right now. Ain't never getting out of this one. This one's never going to change. Might as well just get you. Might as well just get used to it. 
Because the circumstance, the situation, the problem that you had is never going to change. This woman had already resigned herself to death. She had already said, I'm going to make this little cake for me and my boy. We're going to eat our last meal and we're going to die. Let me tell you right now, God knows where you are. Amen. God knows your past. God knows the situation that you are in right now. And God still wants to use you right now. Because God can use anyone. So the prophet goes to Zarephath, this little town, and comes to this little widow who doesn't have much. Now what somebody wants to say is she didn't have anything. No, what I want to say is she didn't have much. Which leads me to point number two of my message. God will only ask for what you have. He'll never ask you for what you don't have. Think about that. God will never ask you for something that you don't have. Ever. God only asks you for what you have. Now let's think about our story before we turn it on ourselves. We'll make it on ourselves in a minute. The prophet could have walked up to her and said, Hey, how about you fry me a steak? She could have said, are you crazy? Do you realize that the drought, the cow, don't already die? There ain't no steaks in here, man. What are you asking for a steak? He didn't ask for a steak. He could have walked up and said, hey, I ain't lost for cows and shrimp. But she didn't have that. Right. He didn't even ask. I'll make it a little more logical. He didn't have said, hey, you got any fruits and vegetables for the poor traveler, man? But she didn't have any fruits and vegetables. He didn't ask her for anything extravagant. He asked her for a drink of water, which even during a drought was probably a little something you didn't have a whole lot to spare. Yeah. But she had it. Because God will never ask you for what you don't already have. You know what that means? Everybody in here has something. Now, you can make this message, and, and usually when I'm studying out, I'll, I'll put it in a scripture text, and when I'm, I'll get all my notes together, and I'll, you know, I'm, I'm forming my sermon. I don't know how the rest of the preachers do this, but I'm forming my sermon. And then I'll usually, because the, uh, here's me telling myself, because the words in the concordances that I have in the Bible and in, in my office are getting really, 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 really hard for me to read. I've got all kind of concordances in there, and I'm using my phone, and I'm, I'm acting like, it, the lighting in this room is terrible. It has nothing to do with the lighting in the room. <laughs> Brother Cluster wears a miner's hat when he studies, with the one that got the light right on the top. <laughs> and we're blaming, the, we got to get some new light bulbs in here. No, you need to get some glasses in here. What pride will keep you from doing I'm just going to keep using the iPhone. Praise God for the light on the iPhone. But because I, I, I don't always use the physical books that I have in my office, although I've got tons of them, I'll, I'll type in the scripture text on the computer because I can read that easier. And, I'll, you know, so for, for this morning's message earlier this week, I typed in 1 Kings 17 and 8, and then it'll usually come up the first the first couple things that you can click on are usually just different versions of, you know, one will be King James, and one will be NIV, and one will be ESV, and one will be, uh, you know, all kinds of different Bibles. And then, then if you scroll down a little bit more, it's usually, we'll start getting into concordances, here's Matthew Henry's, and here's here's Schofield's, and here's this, and, and then, there, then if you really keep on scrolling, you might run into a sermon or two that somebody preached on this, you know, and sometimes I like to click on them and see how dumb I am. I'm clicking on to see what the world is everybody else preaching about this message. Everybody preaches the same thing about this message. Everybody. It's all about money. Every one of them. Yes, sir. It's all about money. Because you got to give God His first. Yeah. Now look. 
Before you think that that's not true, let me tell you, that's true. I ain't going to make this message about money because as soon as you start talking about money, everybody, that it, 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 you fit in one or two categories. I know. I know. But I don't have to get up here and preach it a lot because you're all good at paying your tithes. Make sure you don't ever change. If you change, then I have to start preaching stuff. <laughs> but usually what it is, when you start talking about money, the person that ain't got none said, sorry, I had to talk about money. Just want my money. I ain't got a whole lot of money. Why are you talking about money? And then the person that got a whole lot, like, I earned this, bro. You ain't getting it. So you're, I'm usually in the other category. I ain't got a whole lot, so. The other day I thought I lost my debit card. Oh, no. Don't worry about it. Ain't nothing in there. When I told my wife, I'm like, what if somebody stole an agent or? <laughs> there ain't nothing in there. Well, you want to steal it, go ahead. You, you can might get a happy you meal out of it. <laughs> you can't even put gas in your car with it now. You can't. Hey, you go down by the but car, every you message that I read, so I, 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 I want to get this one out. I want to throw it out there, okay? And you're all going to pick it up and throw it right back. I'm not going to preach a message on money, but I am going to tell you this. You better give God his first. I'm going to say it that way. You get mad at me if you want. Don't be one of these folks. Honey thing gives you 24 hours to pay I said I was going to preach on this. Don't be one of these folks that say, I'll see what I got left at the end of the day. Uh-uh, honey. You better give God his first. Just going to say that. I'm just putting it out. But I ain't going to preach that. I'm not going to preach because, see, it would be real easy for him to walk up to that widow woman, Sister Gay, and say, hey, you got 20 bucks? She would have said, no. Nope. So I'm not going to make this message about money because then everybody that's struggling with money right now, which is the majority of people that I know, I ain't got no rich friends. <laughs> the majority of people I know right now are like, I don't know. Paycheck to paycheck. Going to have to start riding the bike torch. Right, Sister Des? You got to put some air in the huffy because guess what? Because most people that I know are saying, I don't know, am I going to put gas in the car or buy some eggs? Am I gonna put? Am, am I gonna pay the gas bill or the electric bill? Well, I know. Well, it's it's summertime now, so I don't. Right. It's summertime now, so we can just let the gas bill go because if they we don't need the heat. So most people that I know struggling with money don't want to hear a message about that. So I'm not gonna talk about your money this morning. But here's what I'm gonna tell you: you've all got something. God wants to use you. The devil wants to convince you you ain't got nothing God wants. So when he went to this widow, he didn't ask for anything other than what she already had. And the devil wants to convince you right now that there ain't nothing you got that God wants. And I'm here to tell you the devil is a liar. God wants you right now where you are. He knows where you are. He knows your past. He knows your present. And he'll never ask you for anything that you don't already have. He asked this woman for something that she already had. So what do you have? What do you have that God would possibly want? Preacher, what do, I don't, I don't know what you, you already said you're not talking about money. Thank goodness for that because I'd have been out for the rest of the message. Just give God his first. Here's how I was taught about tithing. It was real simple. It was so simple that the children from the class, I could bring them out and teach them tithing right now. And they would understand it because here's what I was taught. If you ain't got nothing, you don't know nothing. If you got something, mm -mm -mm. but we're not talking about money this morning. What do you got? What's God want from me? Well, He wants your heart. You all got one of those. He wants to save your soul. You all got one of those. He's only going to ask you for what you what you got. Well, brother Darrell, I gave God my heart a long time ago. I got saved in 1971. And God's had my heart ever since. 
What does God want from me? Well, some of those things that you say, I don't have that. Like time. We ain't got no time, Brother Daryl. We got so much going on. I got this and I got that. And I'll make it to church if I can find them. Time. And if I can't make it, thank God for it. God will never ask you for what you don't have. But when God asks you for a little bit, listen to me, when God asks you for a little bit of your time, I would highly suggest you give God His first. I don't have the time. I just can't make it fit in. I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, and I gotta go here, and I gotta go there, and I gotta make sure this is done, and I gotta make sure that's done, and after all that other stuff is taken care of, if I got any time left, which leads me to point number three, and I gotta finish on this, he does not want your leftovers. We want God to, oh, I gotta preach this morning like I feel it. If you don't, I know some people get mad at me. We want God to supply all our needs, but we want to give him about 20% of what we got left. God is not interested in your leftovers. He told the woman who was in a, listen, in a bad situation, in a bad way. I know everybody here could tell me about how bad it is where you're at. Your life is bad, your marriage is bad, your job is bad, everything is bad, it's terrible, 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 terrible. And he went up to a widow woman in a little no-name town. And he said, make me a cake first. Yes, God knew where she was. Yes, God knew her past. Yes, God knew her presence. And no, God was not asking her for anything that she did not already have. He simply said, give me mine first. The Bible says way over in the New Testament. Well, Brother Daryl, that's just the Old Testament, you know, and the law went out. We're not under the law. Remember, we're under a new covenant. We got... We don't have to worry about what it says in 1 Kings. All we got to worry about is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Asheville. Okay, that's wonderful that you believe that. Matthew 6 and 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the verse ends, And all these things shall be added. If you're adding, that means there's some more. I, so I feel like shouting, but I don't, I don't know how to do that. And all these things shall be added unto you. That means God was going to add to what you already had if you put him. We want God to do this, and we want God to do that. And God wants to do all those things because he can use dirt and a rib and a, and a donkey and a bird and a whale and a stick. And God can use you, and God wants to use you, and God wants to add to what you give What you give him first. I'm not going to make it about money. I'm just going to say this real fast. So grab on to it real quick. You want some more money? God will add to what you already have if you give him his first. God's not going to ask for what you don't have. See, this scripture, this chapter, Matthew 6, it talks about all these things. And don't worry about what you're going to wear. God will supply what you need to wear. And don't worry about what you're going to eat. God will supply what you need to eat. It's the, the, the birds of the field, the birds of the air, and the, and, the, and, the, and the flowers in the field. I'm paraphrasing. God takes care of the flowers in the field. He takes care of the birds in the air. And all this stuff. Like, oh, that's... And he says, if God takes care of that, will he take care of you? And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next verse says, seek ye first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness and all these things that you just read about, all those things that you stress about, all those things that you worry about, all those things that you can't fix, all those things that you can't make better, all those things that you don't know how you're going to get out of, over, and around. God said, if you give me mine first, I'll take care of all that stuff that you can't take care of. Hey, widow woman, it hasn't rained in three years, and you can't grow a weed right now. But if you give me mine first, I'll make sure you never need. I'll make sure I add to what you have. So why do we have a cake war? Because three things the devil wants you to think this morning. First thing he wants you to think is God don't want your cake. God don't want you. You did this and you did that and you did this and you did that and you messed this up and God knows what you did yesterday and what you thought about when you got out of bed this morning. God wants you. Right now. So the devil's a liar when he says, God doesn't want your, God doesn't like that kind of cake. Yeah, God's like me. He likes all kinds of cake. Yeah. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it easy for you to understand. God likes all kinds of cake. Whatever it is. So don't let the devil make you think God doesn't want what you have because he does. And the devil wants you to think, just like he wanted this widow woman to think, you don't have enough cake. That's what he wanted her to think, because the prophet said, make me a cake. She said, I got enough for all of us. I just got enough for me and my son. We're going to eat it and die. So the devil wants you to think, you don't have enough. What don't you have enough of? Anything. All right. You don't have enough time. Yeah, you do. Give God his. I don't have enough money. Give God his. Because the devil wants you to think you don't have enough cake to give God his. So there's this cake war between you and the devil. And you're saying, nah, 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 nah. because I don't have what God wants. And I don't have enough of what God wants. And then the devil wants you to think you can have your cake and eat it too. In other words, the devil wants you to have this mindset. Do you first. And here's why I can preach to the saint and the sinner alike. Because the devil will lie to all of us. And say just do you first. Take care of you. Oh man I feel it. The fiery darts are coming right now. Because I know how the devil talks. Because just because I'm the preacher. Don't think he don't talk. As a matter of fact he probably talks to me more. He likes to leave you guys alone until you come to my house. And what he wants you to just do you, if the devil can get you, oh man, I'm, I feel the Holy Ghost. If the devil can get you preoccupied on trying to do you, and you stop doing God because you're trying to do you first, then the devil doesn't already want to take war. Because he makes you the thing that you can have your cake and eat it too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to seek me first, the kingdom of God, and he'll take Christian folks do. We don't think that we let the devil lie to us because we just use scripture. The devil tried to use scripture on Jesus Christ. So you know what he does with good intention Christian? Because I know there's some folks in here right now, I ain't no sinner. Well, you do, preach to me like I'm a sinner. No. Preach to you like you're a good intention saint of God that thinks you have to do you first. Well, Pastor, I gotta do this, man. I gotta get this, I gotta work this out. No, you don't. Seek ye first. You don't understand. I gotta take care of this. This has to get rectified. No, it. We can uh, The Bible says, save yourself from this untoward generation. 
I can preach the gospel and I can love folks and I can want everybody to do the right thing for the kingdom of God, but I cannot do it for them. And I cannot worry about doing me first because I have to put God first. So guess what? I'm going to love folks, but I'm going to love God first. I'm going to try to help When I do, the Bible says he adds things. Because if you read that verse, it says that the widow and her son and the prophet ate for many days. As a matter of fact, they ate until the drought ended. They ate until the thunder clouds opened up and it rained so hard that the prophet had to say, you better get down before the rain stops you. That means it's going to rain so hard, it might wash the road out. They ate until then. Because if you put God first, all those things that all those things that you're struggling with, God's going to take care of them. All those things that you're worried about, God's going to fix them. All that stuff that's broke, God's going to put it back. First, Amen. I'll tell you this, and I say this with confidence. Don't want to add to the word of God. I just say this with confidence. If that widow, who I don't think at any time during this process was rude or condescending to the prophet, as a matter of fact, she said, "As the Lord your God liveth," I think she was a believer. Yeah. If she would have said, I'd "Like to help you," but I can take care of me first. If she would have said, don't take this the wrong way, preacher. I thank you for trying to encourage me in your messages. And I thank you for trying to make me believe and trying to convince me that God wants to use me. But, eh, God don't want what I got. I don't have enough for God, so thanks. I'm going to take care of me first. And when I get this all fixed up and all worked out, then, then come back then. I promise you this. If she had baked the cake and ate it, they would have found her and her son dead on the ground. Because she would have put her first. She would have lost the cake more. She would have died with a piece of cake in her mouth. Because she didn't put God first. All those things that you have in your world, they're real. I am not, as a matter of fact, I'm not, I'm not trying to lessen the effects of whatever it is that has happened in your world. Pain hurts. Disappointment hurts. Being let down hurts. When someone stabs you in the back, it hurts. When someone walks away from you, it hurts. When you get divorced, it hurts. When you lose a job, it hurts. When you ain't got no money to pay the bills or feed the babies, it hurts. And I am not ever trying to lessen the effects of the pain or the disappointment. I am telling you this. If you will put God first, he will take care of all that stuff that you're struggling with. Trying to take care of it on your own. If you will put him first. Don't let the devil lie to you and say God can't use you. You did this and you did that and you messed up. God really can't use you if you got this going on. Oh, yes, he can. And not only can he, he wants to. He, I hope you can believe me, because I'm getting ready to close. They can do whatever they're going to do for closing. I hope you can believe this, because I don't want to make myself sound like something. But I don't, God sent the prophet to the widow. He didn't send the widow to the prophet. He sent the prophet to the widow. Why are you saying that, Pastor? It's God sending you a message this morning. God cared enough about you. That's why I said I want you to, I want you to make this message about you. I want you to, to blur out and, and, and close off everyone else. This is just Pastor Daryl talking to you. Because God sent the prophet to the widow. And God sent the prophet, the preacher, the pastor, the man of God, right to you this morning. And all he's saying is, I'll never ask you for what you don't already have. And I 
know where you are, and I know what you're going through, and I know what you're dealing with. Just put me first. I'll fix all that other stuff. You can't do it. You know how bad you're making it trying. Because most of the time when we try to fix it, we just make it worse. The woman with the issue of blood spent all that she had on the physicians. And the Bible says she didn't grow any better. She rather grew worse. Wonder if she had come to Jesus first. I, I can promise you one thing. Uh, talking about the woman with the issue of blood, if she had come to Jesus first, she'd have more money. Because she wouldn't have wasted everything that she had on something that wasn't going to... That's a whole other message. She wouldn't have wasted everything she had on something that wasn't going to work. So he sent the prophet to the widow. So I want you to take it personal this morning. God sent the preacher to you. I know you came here this morning. Don't get me wrong. I know you got in your car and you drove here. God sent the preacher to you to give you a very simple message. I know where you are. You're in Zarephath. I know your past. You're a widow. I know your present. It's a drought and it's bad and it looks like it's going to get worse. I'll never ask more of you than what you already have. But I don't want the leftovers. So you know what I want from you? I want you, listen, I want you first. Give God you first. Before you try to do this, before you try to fix this, before you try to rectify that, before you think you can put this back together and you can do it. God says, give it to me first. Give me the cake first. And I'll take care of all that. I will add to you what you already have and then some. I like the scripture that says he'll give you pressed down, shaken together. Listen, hold on, hold on, Reverend, let's quote that scripture. You don't get pressed down, shaken together, running over if you don't give God first. You can all stand. Here's what I want. Believe the preacher this morning. Don't let the devil convince you that God doesn't want you and God doesn't need you and nothing that you have is good enough and that you got to fix you first. That's what he wanted the widow to think. Go bake the cake for you and your son first. Don't worry about that. And she would have died in her dilemma if she had not put God first. Say, God, here's what I want you to say. God, I ain't got much. But what I do have, I give it to you first. Watch and see what God does. The altar is open this morning. Come on up in your presence.